All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Google Search Central SEO Office Hours Hangout. My name is John Mueller. I am a search advocate at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these office hour hangouts where people can join in and ask their questions around search and their website. A um, bunch of things were submitted already on YouTube, so we can go through some of those. But if any of you want to get started with a question of your own, feel free to jump in now. Uh if I can start, if I can be first, would be nice. Sure. Thank you, John. Um, so earlier earlier this week, actually, like two or three days ago, I noticed that one of my clients' websites, um, some pages got it, the indexed, and it says that the user declared canonical is is just a different page. But then I checked the pages, the, the HTML code shows that it's a self-referencing canonical. So it's actually pointing to the correct one. And and then when I use the live, uh, how do you call it? the the live tool to, to check the live URL, it actually shows that is the correct canonical, but still reported there. And some of those pages are still the index. So I'm not really sure how that happened. I checked the website, nothing really changed. So I I don't really know how to tackle that problem because we lost some some keywords, some rankings, some traffic because of that. Yeah. I. I, like on my side, what what I'd need to do is look into those specific details. So what I would usually recommend for a case like this is to post those details in in the help forum first, and get some input from other people. And uh, the product experts in the help forum they can escalate threads when they see that things aren't kind of working out. So that's kind of the direction I would head there. I, I have seen some cases like this, not, not specifically like this week or last week. Uh, but in general, it happens every now and then that something on the website is configured in a way that makes it really hard for us to crawl and index the pages. Uh, so I've seen that, for example, with uh, a site that uses uh, some ad blocker scripts or anti-ad blocker scripts, I guess. And uh, then in cases like that, those scripts sometimes redirect to a, a central page. And that has a rel canonical on it. Or we, we pick up the redirect, and we use that kind of as a canonical signal, uh, those kind of things. And that can sometimes trigger, depending on the way that we crawl. Uh, so maybe like for the normal crawls, it doesn't trigger. And then every now and then, it does trigger. And it triggers right at that moment. Uh, when we pick up something that we want to use for indexing. Um, but that's something that sometimes is noticeable when you look at the specifics of the site. Like If you look at the other URLs, then you can see, oh, they have similar issues sometimes, which kind of points to this kind of sporadic type of an issue. And sometimes it's just like, like I don't know, some one-off quirk that might have happened, maybe from a CDN that's involved in the middle, maybe from the hosting side, mm -hmm. something like that, uh, that just happened to kind of step in in between. OK, interesting. And I'm, I also wanted to ask, I noticed that there is many uh, other pages that are not um, indexed because of uh, the trailing slash. I don't know. This is the first time. Like like most of the other pages, you don't see you don't see that. Uh, you know, sorry. Many other websites I've seen that there's nothing in the report, even though you know the, the pages have the trailing slash or if it doesn't have it, it's still considered the same page. But for this particular website, it seems like many pages without the trailing slash were the index. I don't know if if that gives us a, a hint of something going on. I don't know. It's it's hard to say. So by default, we wouldn't see the trailing slash and not trailing slash as the same URL. It is something that technically we would consider one to be kind of the, the root of a folder and the other a file name within the, the higher level folder. Uh, so we wouldn't, by, by default, try to equate those. Uh, if we crawl them and we see the same content, then we pick them up and we try to use them for canonicalization. So that's something that then kind of happens as a second step. And depending on the way that you have the site verified in Search Console, if you just have like that subdirectory verified and the mm -hmm. URL is the one without the trailing slash, then we would assume that URL is no longer a part of that site if you kind of focus on the subdirectory. 
And we we have that that same problem right right at the moment with uh, our kind of new search documentation, which is also hosted on developersgoogle.com slash search without a trailing slash. Uh, and we have the URL with the trailing slash verified in our Search Console account. Uh, so we kind of have a similar situation that sometimes we just don't see the, the traffic or the, the clicks and impressions there. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any other questions before we get started? Uh oh. Hi, Yo. I got one. Um, so quickly on the core update that was released yesterday. Um, one is, could I have some understanding on the rationale behind the timing of that? If you at all were involved or saw any some type of emails around why you timed it for right after Cyber Monday, but before the holidays, what's the rationale there? I don't know. I don't. I mean, I don't know. From from my side, it feels like. A reasonable time. Like I, I, I wasn't involved in the decisions there, but it's like not, not really in the holiday season and kind of after the the whole Thanksgiving rush. Um, so it felt like I don't. At least from my point of view, it wasn't something that I would have flagged and said, "Oh, you need to watch out for this." Okay, thank you. And two, um, people are asking me with the core update. This doesn't mean passage indexing or ranking is out. Uh, you will. That has not gone out with this. It's not live yet in terms of the passage indexing. I know because you said at the end of the year, passage indexing will be live by then. Um, but it's not out yet, right, as far as you know? I I don't think. I mean, I, I don't know if it's out yet. But usually, the, the core update wouldn't be something that we would bundle with other kinds of changes like that. So it's, it's something that may, maybe is coming out at the same time. But it wouldn't be because of the core update. It would be kind of like. More of a coincidence. Uh, I don't know what the the timing plans are for that. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sure. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Jen. How are you? Uh, I left you uh, one of the comments on the uh, post, but I just wanted to ask you because I thought that it, I could not make it that clear, and I thought it was easier to tell you, you know, by by voice. So uh, you know, basically, uh, the problem that we're facing, and what I wanted to ask you is, if you guys still have reports on uh, any canonical bugs uh, for USA content and for USA uh, country, because uh, of what we do is we're a sports uh, international media company, and we've been having a lot of problems with our live blogs, which you know usually uh, has recurrent teams because you know they play two times during the season. And only in US selected as uh, language and selected as, I mean, English as the language and USA as a country, we don't show up, even though Google Search Console it's reporting that it's indexed. But the funny thing is, if you go to UK uh, with English uh, language setup, we show up as the first, uh, you know, SERP in most of the searches. So it's something that is, is uh, happening specifically just for US. And it only happens for our live blogs, which we assume it has to do with something that, you know, it's recurrent teams that we're mentioning because we're not really having the canonical blogs for any, uh, you know, like news that is happening, which, you know, we only report once. So I was wondering, you know, if you guys have any reports on the on the canonical blogs that it still happens because they just started happening maybe two months ago. Before that, it was, you know, perfectly normal showing up as, as usual. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any issues around kind of the canonicalization and indexing at the moment. So, and then also from how you describe it, it sounds like it's less an issue of indexing and more an issue of around kind of like internationalization uh, for the site. So, just, just to double check, do you have? Separate URLs for the UK, or do you have the same URL that is just visible in the UK but not visible in the US? It is the same URL, and we just place reflangs. But our source, uh, it's as a publisher for US, so everything everything is working supposedly the way it should. It just stopped working two months ago, and it only stops working for live blo blogs, which we use recurring uh, recurring teams. If we you know make a live blog of, I don't know, a game that hasn't been happening much, or from a team you know that. Is not that that you know common. Uh, it shows up perfectly, which it makes it really really tough to to understand why this is happening. Yeah, I don't know that. 
to, to me, that doesn't sound like an indexing bug. That, that really sounds like something around internationalization. Um, and the, the hreflang side there might also be something that's playing a role there. How, how, how do you have the hreflang set up? Is that like one English URL and then like a Spanish URL or a French URL? Or how, how do you link those? Yeah, we just have a one URL, and we just uh, then place if it's you know for N US or N only or you know N MX depending on on which uh, countries we're trying to attack through the F, through the uh, ref lang. Okay, I like I I don't know I'd, I'd have to look at the specific details, but offhand it feels like something where maybe with the href lang setup. So something is is not quite the way that it should work, and that's something that sometimes causes more problems, sometimes causes less problems. But uh, probably that's something that you'd be able to resolve there. What what you could do is maybe post some of the details here in the chat, and I can pick up the chat afterwards, uh, or post the details in the help forum as well, so that uh, kind of like some some other people can throw some eyes at it. OK, all right, John. Uh, sure. So I will post it on, on the forum, and then I will uh, let you know where it is so you can check it. Thank you so much. Sure, thanks. All right, I think someone else is trying to jump in and ask a question as well. Go for it. Yes. Hello, Jon. Do you hear me? Hi. Yes. Yes, great. So um, as you maybe know uh, on the Twitter right now, so we have a problem with the the, the Discover feed in Sweden. We have had it since, I think, like in the middle of uh, December last last year, and it's it's a fairly amount of sites that have uh, this issue. Um, so, yeah, they are these sites are not showing up in the Swedish Discover feed when uh, when you are in Sweden, but if you like turn on a VPN. Then it's turned on, um, and uh, yeah, of course, if you are outside of Sweden and um, if you are outside of Sweden and um, go into the Discover feed, it's also showing up. Okay. Um, I it's I don't know off offhand about that because it's I, I believe that's something that we already passed on a while ago, and you're you're still seeing this happening with. Like no changes at all, or yeah, 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 exactly. I I can show you if you want, or maybe you can post a, a link in the chat here. Then I can pick that up afterwards. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, cool, mm, pretty great. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Cool. Okay, let me run through some of the questions that were submitted, and we'll definitely have more time for for your direct questions as well uh, along the way. Um, let's see. I'll try to run through these fairly quickly, since it seems like lots of questions are here. Uh, when it comes to anchor text from external links pointing to my website, do you check the anchor text only on a page-by-page -page basis, or do you also look at site-wide anchor text? Uh, we look at both. So we, we do look at it on a per-page basis to understand kind of the context of individual pages. Uh, you notice this in particular if a page is blocked by robots text and is still indexed, then you'll see kind of the anchor text as something that we might use as a title uh, in the search results for that page. Uh, but we also look at the anchor text for sites overall because it does give us a little bit of a kind of a broader understanding of how that site is embedded in the web. Uh, so that's something that we, we try to take into account where we can. Uh, we're experiencing huge ranking fluctuations, where a specific page drops for most relevant keywords from the top places to pages three to five and come back, comes back a few days later. And this keeps repeating. We're quite sure it's not just normal fluctuations, since there's a repeating exact same pattern. Uh, these are high volume, high competition keywords. Any idea what might be the cause of this? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I occasionally see that from people. It's not something that I would say is completely out of the question that this kind of thing happens. Oftentimes, it settles down because our algorithms figure out, oh, this is kind of a stable place, uh, how we should be ranking this site. Uh, if your site used to be ranking much lower, then this could be a sign that our algorithms are kind of wondering, 
Should we be ranking it a lot better? Uh, if your site used to be ranking better for this and sometimes gets dropped down like that, then it could be a sign that our algorithm is a little bit cautious more, maybe. Uh, so that's something which I would kind of take as a sign to significantly improve the quality of the website overall so that our algor algorithms are less on the fence and have kind of clear understanding that this is actually a really good website that we should be showing more. Um, then my website is losing indexing. For some weeks, my website has been losing indexing for no apparent reason, and no significant changes have been made except for the usual ones that are adding and removing vehicles. Uh, so I, the, the website was mentioned there, and I took a brief look beforehand. And one of the things that I noticed specifically with regards to the indexing of the content on the website is that it's really hard to crawl and index uh, the content from your site. Uh, so for example, if I do a site query for the website, uh, then a lot of the pages that I find are kind of weird listing pages where I suspect maybe a vehicle or product used to be available and is no longer available, and it's kind of like with an ID of a very high number. And uh, my, my general feeling is there that we're just having a lot of trouble crawling and indexing the website. Uh, so that's something where what, what I would do is try to figure out which URLs you really care about. And first of all, put those in a sitemap file if you haven't done so already. And then secondly, try to figure out, like, are these URLs actually being indexed properly? And Additionally, look at the other URLs that are being indexed for the website at the moment. Uh, if you look at a site query, that's kind of a rough idea to do that. And think about how those URLs were discovered. So the URLs that you don't care about, like why is Google spending so much time on them? Uh, with the end goal essentially being kind of making it really clear for search engines which URLs you want to have indexed being absolutely certain that Google can crawl your website normally and find those URLs and can focus on just those URLs that you care about. Uh, so that's kind of my, my recommendation there. Uh, sometimes it also helps to use something like a, a third-party crawler tool to kind of crawl your website if you're not sure where these URLs are being picked up on. Um, there are a bunch of different tools out there. Um, some of them are, are really good. Uh, so that might be an option to kind of try out while you're figuring out why are search engines kind of getting lost within my website. Um, mobile searches related to glasses or prescription glasses uh, are resulting in duplicate content on the same page in the first search results page. It's due to the interesting find section, which seems odd. Uh, are you aware of this behavior? Uh, does Google consider this to be an issue? Uh, so I don't know exactly what, what you're seeing there, so it's really hard to say. Uh, in particular, a lot of the different sections in the search results page trigger in individual countries or trigger differently in individual countries. So when I search in English, I tend to get Swiss sites uh, in English. Uh, I don't tend to see exactly the same thing as users in the US would see. So that kind of makes it hard for me to figure out what, what exactly you're seeing there. Uh, if you can send me some screenshots or maybe post them on Twitter or add them here to the YouTube uh, comments, then I'm, I'm happy to take those and also send those to the teams here that work on the search results page. I think, in general, when it comes to different elements on a search results page, it's also always kind of tricky to find that balance between providing lots of usefulness for users, lots of value for users, and uh, ultimately providing too much clutter, essentially, in the search results, where if you look at the search results page, there are just so many different items there, and they're all kind of competing for your attention. And sometimes it can happen that you have different sections that show the same content, which, from my point of view, is kind of just, I don't know, unnecessary clutter. It's not something I would consider to be a, a serious bug or anything like that, or it's definitely not something we would do on purpose. Uh, but sometimes it just kind of evolves in that direction over time. And having examples where this is kind of annoying, that's really useful to pass on to your team uh, so that they can understand, oh, if these different 
elements in the search results page are triggering and showing, we should make sure to not show the other thing here, because that's essentially showing the same thing or not as useful for the user. Uh, I'd like to know how Google indexes sites with new extensions, like .club or .tools. Uh, is there any preference for indexing .com domains over these? Uh, so we treat all of the new top-level domains like any other generic top-level domain. So there is no kind of additional value to having keywords in the top-level domain. There is no additional value in having city names or country names in the top-level domain. We treat them all like, like any other generic top-level domain, like, like a .com, essentially. Uh, so from that point of view, if you find a domain name that works well for your site that you want to keep for the long run, and it's a new top-level domain, then definitely go for it. I think that's uh, perfectly fine. Uh, but also keep in mind that there is no kind of bonus for using a particularly well-matching top-level domain. It's not that we would, from an SEO point of view, treat those as anything better than other generic top-level domains. Um, what happens to visitors if we post duplicate content regularly? I don't know. I mean, visitors are kind of out of our control, but uh, from from my point of view, like if you regularly post duplicate content uh, that is already on your website or that's findable on other sites, my assumption is a lot of times visitors will just end up going somewhere else. Uh, because why should they go to your site if they've already seen that content somewhere else? Uh, so that's kind of one of the reasons also why we discourage people from just copying content, because it's something our algorithms can pick up on. And we know users don't like it when we show the same content multiple times, kind of like the previous question there. Uh, so that's something where if you want to provide something on the web and you want to make sure that's visible in search, make sure it's unique, compelling, high quality, all of the, the usual, usual attributes. Uh, if our business has good ratings on some authentic websites, can showing those ratings to on our site influence algorithms rank or rankings, uh, not considering user behavior? Um, I don't think that changes anything. So if you have like a five-star rating from some other service and you put that on your website, I don't think our ranking algorithms will look at that and say, oh, this sounds like a good thing. Uh, so that from that point of view, from just purely an SEO standpoint, I don't think that changes anything. Uh, obviously, users might care. If you show users that your website is trustworthy, that it's regularly um, kind of audited and kind of reviewed, then that's something that they might care about. But uh, at least from an SEO point of view, there is no immediate ranking change. Uh, with this new passage indexing rolling out soon, will this help a site, for example, a blog, to get better rankings for more opportunities, for more search terms per article uh, that is published? Uh, so the kind of the passage ranking or passage indexing update uh, that we talked about there, I, like I mentioned in the beginning, I don't know the timing of this, uh, when, when it will be visible where. Uh, but essentially, the idea is to take particularly long pages and understand the relevant parts within that page a little bit better uh, so that we can show those appropriately in the search results. Uh, so that's something, if you have really long articles, um, then it might be that we pick up something useful in the middle and we send users to that directly. Uh, if you've been doing SEO for a while now, if you've been focusing on your website for a bit, then probably you've already split those ex like exceptionally long articles into shorter ones anyway, uh, so that it's easier to focus on specific aspects of what people are searching for. And in those cases, like, there's nothing really that you need to do there. Uh, so that's something where I like to see it more as if like you have really long pages on your site and you've never really bothered to kind of watch out for what users actually want and realize that, oh, users are looking for a part of the page, not the full page, then that's something where I assume passage ranking will help out a bit. But it's not the case that we'll just take any article on the web and say, oh, there's like a good word on way, way down on the bottom of the page. Therefore, we will rank this page higher. 
it's not a general ranking improvement. It's more a better understanding of the content. John, can I follow up on that? Yes. Yeah, so I had a question sure. that was very similar. Uh, similar. You answer. You answer part of it in there, where you had said, you know. If you're a good savvy SEO, you may have already taken a long page and split it out into multiple pages. So I guess what I'm wondering, so that that is still the recommendation, um, I, I guess. And, and you know, so I, I had an example of, um, let's say you have a business that offers, you know, four or five services. It, it as previously what I would have always taken uh, that and done and created five separate pages, one for each service so that you Google would understand the topic of that page. Um, but with passage indexing, I was wondering, perhaps does it make more sense to have one single page that lists all five services, potentially hoping that passage indexing or passage ranking, as you've said a couple times now, <laughs> passage ranking understands each chunk and the reason why I think that that could be advantageous perhaps is consolidation of uh, link authority and, and, and like link building. So you have one URL now that has multiple links and that page could be very authoritative. Do you think that strategy makes any sense or would you still kind of go to one separate page for each service? I don't know. I, so from, from my point of view, I, I would test it. I, I would I would see how it works. Mm. Um, I I don't think by design that's necessarily a, a bad way to do it. Um, I also don't think it's necessarily kind of like always going to be the right approach, uh, because when when users are looking for something that's kind of on the bottom of the page and they land on the top of the page, then maybe they'll be lost and your conversions will suffer a bit. I don't know. Uh, but I, I would definitely try it out and see see what happens. Like I'm, I I could imagine that may, maybe you find a balance that works well and is kind of positive under the line for you. So theoretically, that's how passage ranking or passage indexing could could work. Where now you know this if it, previously they had this one page with ten different services, it'd be hard to understand the topics of all of them. But now passage ranking might better understand. Well, this is about service A. This one's about service B, and then rank those sections or passages appropriately for queries. So this yeah. theoretically could work. Could it be better? Yeah, I guess that's to be tested. I yeah, I, I I don't know. I mean, it's it's kind of tricky because we we could still understand that that part of the page is appropriate for that query, but uh, would would there perhaps be a factor saying, well, the other parts are kind of contrary to that part of the page is understanding. Like if you have completely independent services, then it might look like, oh, you're offering consulting and you're selling products. And if someone is trying to buy a product, then it's like, well, which how how do we weigh these? Things? Yeah, that totally but, makes sense. If it, if it's way off, yeah, that probably. But like maybe an electrician that offers, you know, um, you know, outdoor lighting, interior lighting, all these different services. They're all electrical services. Um, yeah, okay, that's cool. I might uh, yeah. I might give it a shot. I I would try it out. I mean, all of these new things, I. I think are just always interesting also to, to see how they kind of react to something like that, where you kind of have an understanding of what you would expect, and you can see if, if you would see changes like that. Mm. Wonderful. I'll, I'll wait for you to tell us when it goes live. <laughs> I mean, you could, also, you could also do something like that now and see what the effect is currently, because some effect will also be there, because it's always this balance of taking multiple pages that kind of have to rank on their own, you're diluting the value, or you're concentrating that value on a single page. Yep. Uh, so some effect you might see already. And when we switch that on, you might see, oh, well, uh, overall, there's an even stronger effect now. But I, I honestly don't know. Yep. Uh, and I think it's something that probably depends quite a bit on, on the type of site that it is. So just taking any random 10 pages and putting them together on one page, that's probably a bad idea. But maybe there are certain configurations, like, like you mentioned, where it could make sense. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. Sure. Um, and I have your question next. Is there anything else that you'd like to add there? with regards to passage indexing? No, no, you covered it very thoroughly. Thank you. OK, 
Cool. Um, are you still planning on dropping support for the Webmasters Discovery document? End of the year. There haven't been any updates uh, since the original blog post in August. And I urgently need to plan changes if this is still true. Um, I just double checked with the team. I haven't heard back. So I'll, I'll double check to see what, uh, what is happening there and maybe post an update in the YouTube comments uh, to your question. Um, from looking at the old blog post from August, it seemed like it was pretty clear that we're going to drop that discovery document. Um, but maybe there's a new discovery document that you can switch to. I don't know. Um, feels a bit like I'm following you, but I could really use your help. Uh, we have a website, which is a Finnish site that got penalized in January for thin content. Since then, we basically rebuilt it from scratch, addressing every possible issue related to thin content. Uh, affiliation on the site is minimal and with value to users. We're trying our best to make the site as good as possible. Uh, for them, um, but we keep getting rejected uh, from the reconsideration request. And not sure what to do now. And in general, how does a site owner get more clarity when dealing with such issues, such as manual actions? Uh, so kind of to, to the last part with regards to getting a bit more clarity, uh, what I would recommend doing there is posting in the help forum, in the Search, Search Central help forums. Um, because like I mentioned, the product experts have seen a ton of websites. And they can give you advice in lots of different directions, uh, especially with regards to manual actions. A lot of those cases also end up in the help forums. And they can escalate issues where appropriate when it looks like someone from the web spam team might need to take a better look at that. Uh, so that's. I, essentially the, the place that I would go there. I think I, I briefly looked at, at your site and uh, the manual actions that, that were associated there. And I, I didn't double check with the web spam team with regards to what you should be doing or what you could be doing differently there. Uh, but one of the things I noticed is that you have a lot of different sites that are essentially focusing on very similar topics. And I know the web spam team sometimes uses this kind of manual action as well to help clean up these issues where you have a ton of different sites that are essentially targeting the same keywords, where it tends to look more like a collection of doorway sites. Uh, so that's something where, if, if that's the case, if you have a lot of different sites that are essentially all the same content, uh, then that's something I would try to resolve uh, in, in addition to just fixing things on this one particular site. Because one of the things the web spam team kind of worries about is you fix this one site, and uh, your manual action is resolved there. And then you take that and you use that across a big network of sites. Uh, so that's something at least to address in a reconsideration request uh, when you submit that and probably something the product experts would also pick up on, uh, where when, when they look at your thread and look at your site, they're like, oh, but what about this network of sites that you have here? What, what is the, the relationship here? Um, yeah. And if you end up not getting anything useful from, from the help forum, uh, feel free to escalate it here in one of these office hours again. And I can pass that on to the web center team directly to see if I can get something more specific that I can point you at. Uh, when considering multi-language and multi-regional sites and hreflang implementations, is there any problem with combining usage of subdomains, country code top-level domains, generic top-level domains, and subfolders? Uh, for example, example.com slash UK uh, or fi.domain.com or domain.se. Uh, you can definitely combine all of these. Uh, for hreflang, it doesn't matter at all which URL patterns that you use. Uh, for geotargeting, we need to be able to understand a clear section of your site. Uh, and uh, in particular, for geotargeting, what we look at is either the country code top-level domain, uh, or if you have a generic top-level domain, the setting that you have in Search Console, which you can apply on a subdomain or subdirectory level as well. 
so something like domain.com slash UK would be perfectly fine. You can set geotargeting for that. Um, however, something like domain.se slash UK, that would not work for geotargeting, because we would see that as being part of a country code top-level domain. And we would not let you set the UK geotargeting for that subdirectory. Uh, but for hreflang, if you just have the same content on different pages and you don't care about geotargeting, then that's perfectly fine. Uh, in general, with hreflang, I would use hreflang when you're seeing issues with the wrong country version being shown in the search results. Uh, a really common use case is if you have an international brand where someone searches for a brand name. And just from the brand name alone, we don't know which language version that we should show the user. Uh, then there, hreflang helps us to pick out which version we should show. Uh, whereas if someone is already searching in, in a specific language uh, for like generic term for a product or for your services or something like that, then the hreflang annotation is not really that helpful, because we already understand this user is searching in, the, in that language. Therefore, we should show that user that content. Uh, so that's something kind of to keep in mind ahead of time uh, when you're planning the implementations there. With hreflang, it's very easy to set up very complex implementations. And a lot of times, you don't need to have complex hreflang implementations. You might just need it on a handful of pages across your website. Uh, when determining search ranking or where to position websites, apart from organic traffic, does Google consider traffic from other sources like YouTube or Facebook or Pinterest? Uh, so if a user enters a page via a social media platform, finds the information useful and relevant, uh, does it have any effect on search rankings? Uh, no. At least as far as I know, none of that applies. It's not the case that we would track that for search. Uh, it's not the case that we would use that for any kind of search ranking. Uh, so if, if you're using social media and you're driving traffic to your website, that's fantastic. But I would see that as something that you do for social media and not as something that you're doing for SEO reasons. Of course, you can kind of combine that in looking at the, the longer view. Uh, so if you drive traffic to your site using social media and you encourage them, for example, to link to your site or to, to recommend it so that we can pick it up for search, then indirectly we could pick that up for search. Uh, but it's definitely not the case that just because someone comes from social media, we would rank the site higher. Uh, we have a relatively high volume of URLs in discovered, currently not indexed, in Search Console. What can we do to get Googlebot to crawl those URLs? Uh, is having a CSR, so I guess client-side rendering, a contributing factor for this issue? Um, I, I don't think client-side rendering would be associated with this, because we would still be able to crawl those pages uh, regardless. And client-side rendering, so kind of like if you have a JavaScript-based website and we have to do JavaScript to pick up the content, that's something that usually is, is less problematic with regards to indexing. We can do that fairly easily. Um, usually, if you have a lot of URLs in this discovered, currently not indexed section, that means we've crawled your website. We've seen a lot of these URLs. Uh, but we currently are not convinced that indexing them will be valuable to our users. Uh, so that's something where it's less a matter of something technical that you need to change on your website, and, but more a matter of making it clear to us or to the search engines in general that actually all of this content is very important and useful to have indexed. So um, that's kind of the direction I, I would head there and focus a little bit more on kind of quality rather than just purely quantity. Uh, in general, it's extremely common for websites to be partially indexed. That's kind of Essentially, that's normal. And the indexing rate of any website will fluctuate over time. Uh, so that kind of that number of discovered but currently not indexed, uh, that number will always fluctuate, I think, regardless of the type of website that you have. 
we had m.urls for mobile site, which were used as alternate versions for the desktop version. We now have just the desktop version, so www. And the m.urls are redirected. Should we use a change of address tool in Search Console? Uh, will it change anything with SEO or crawl budget? Uh, you don't need to use the change of address tool. Uh, that's something that we would just pick up the versions automatically. So if you're redirecting, then we will pick that up. There's no need to use a change of address tool. The change of address tool is more if you're actually moving between different websites. Uh, in this case, you're essentially going from m. to www, and that's kind of within the same website. So there is nothing special that we need to do there. Uh, with regards to crawl budget or SEO, this has no effect. Uh, so we, what will happen there over time is we will primarily crawl the www version of the URLs. We will occasionally look at the m. versions, because we might still find links to those pages, or we just want to make sure that we're not missing anything. Uh, but for the most part, we'll concentrate on the www version. And the, from a crawling point of view, that shouldn't be any change overall. Uh, can additional properties in schema, which are not mentioned in the Google documentation, give any benefits uh, to Google, uh, especially in the case of AMP, non-AMP article schema? Uh, if we add AMP article properties on non-AMP pages, is there any harm or benefit? Uh, so there is probably no benefit at all and probably also no harm there. Uh, in general, we recommend using structured data for elements that you want to have visible in the search results. And the ones that we have visible are based on the properties that we have documented. Uh, so if you add structured data for things that we don't use uh, for visible rich results, then like, we, we can crawl those pages still normally. We just don't use that kind of extra information. Uh, it's fairly rare that you would be able to provide some structured data on a page which gives us unique information that we don't see from the page itself. Uh, that helps us to understand that page better. And I think, in particular, the AMP article markup, that's not something that tells us something different about the page. It's just a different way of kind of providing metadata for the page in general. Uh, so I don't. Like, it definitely wouldn't cause any problems, but I don't think you would see any advantage of doing that. Uh, the mobile friendly test is showing our page is mobile friendly, but when I generate the report through Lighthouse in Chrome inspection, it's showing me some issues like tab targets are not sized properly. Uh, can that influence our rankings? Uh, so if the mobile friendly test is saying things are OK, if the Search Console mobile friendliness report is saying things are OK, then you should be all set. Uh, the tricky part with mobile friendliness is there's no objective measure to say this is mobile friendly or not. Uh, in particular, like the tap targets that you mentioned, um, you could argue with, with people that there's a certain size tap target that needs to be there by minimum. Uh, but that's not something that necessarily will be the case across all different sites or all different devices or all different people. Uh, so that exact size that uh, kind of is valid for a large enough tap target, uh, that's something that could vary across the different testing tools. Uh, so if you purely care about how Google Search sees your site for mobile friendliness, then I would use those tools. If you kind of want to get a, a better view of how other tools might see your site or give recommendations uh, with regards to mobile friendliness, then I would definitely take those other tools into account as well. Whew, OK. Hello, John. Hello. Hi. That, that was my question. Actually, okay. I have follow-up. Okay. Uh, recently, we have uh, recently we have revamped our site, and since since then, uh, GS is reporting that mobile friendly issues. But when we do a live inspection within GSC, uh, it shows that mobile uh, that URL is mobile friendly. Uh, should we consider that as an issue or not? Uh, it's it's hard to say. When when you say you've revamped your site, my my general assumption is if the mobile friendly test says it's okay, then I would not worry about it. I assume that those issues in Search Console are mostly 
with regards to kind of rendering your site. And because we cache some of the embedded elements on a page, also like the JavaScript and CSS, uh, it can happen that we have kind of a mixed view of a site that has just been revamped completely. So my assumption is, without looking at those specific examples, uh, that probably this is just a temporary phase and things will settle down over time, like over a couple of months. Then our kind of understanding of the site overall with regards to mobile friendliness, that settles down again. Cool. Um, yeah, I think the, the only new question that came was with regards to the update timing, which I think we chatted about with Barry already in the beginning. Uh, what else is on your mind? What else can I help with? Hi, John. Can we go? John? Oh. Oh. OK, you can start. <laughs> Oh, OK, OK. Uh, John, uh, I have the question about uh, uh, duplicated content, because uh, you replied to this question uh, that uh, it depends on the situation. Uh, and uh, if you are talking about uh, moving service, uh, for example, if uh, we need to move stuff from uh, Toronto to Vancouver or uh, from A to B, and I found that uh, many pages on the top 10 uh, uh, they have uh, two pages separate. Uh, for example, if uh, uh, we want to move from Toronto to Vancouver, uh, this page uh, usually um, uh, submits some information that uh, are related to Vancouver, why you need to live there, better school, better uh, shops, and something like this. And uh, if we create uh, two uh, pages, from uh, Vancouver to Toronto and from Toronto to Vancouver. Uh, uh, is it OK? Or because uh, we have similar titles, Google will understand uh, that uh, these pages have different content. Yeah, I, I think it's hard to say comprehensively there. So for, for just the situation where you have two cities like that, I don't see a problem. That's kind of like you, you have a handful of pages, and you kind of add the alternate versions of those pages. I don't see a problem. If you take all of the cities in Canada and you say all of the combinations, then that's essentially a giant network of unnecessary content on a site that we, we would probably see as doorway pages. Uh, so that's something where. Finding the balance between providing value to users and just filling it out with a database because you have a database of cities, for example, and you have some information from Wikipedia on every city, uh, just because you have that doesn't mean that th those are going to be good pages. But, but users have different intent you know, when they are searching for service to move stuff from Toronto to Vancouver. Um, and uh, you, you know, they want to know about Vancouver. And uh, when I check out the top 10 results, I see that they submit this information. It's not only about uh, uh, some Wikipedia page about Vancouver. Uh, they reply to some questions that people might ask. Uh, their intent, uh, uh, the distance uh, from these cities, and uh, something similar, you know. And uh, we don't know, uh, do we need to create two separate pages or just to create one page? I, I would just create one page, especially one. if you're talking about a large amount of pages. Then that's something where I, I would try to limit it on, on the number of pages. I think. It's, it's sometimes misleading when you look at the search results and you see, oh, other people are creating this kind of thin content, automatic content in different variations. Therefore, we also need to do it. I think that's, that's sometimes misleading. Um, but especially when, when you're starting out, I would focus on a lot fewer pages and make those a lot stronger. Uh, so especially in competition in, with, with other websites, having fewer pages that are just significantly stronger makes those a lot more valuable. And uh, it's also something where you need to watch out for kind of like misleading yourself with regards to the user intent. Uh, so kind of the, the question that you had there, like, well, users might want to find out more about the city. 
I, I really doubt that someone who is looking for transport services from one city to the other wants to have background information about neighborhoods in a city or something like that. Uh, that's something where it's, it's very easy to get this kind of information and just put it on a web page, because you can. It's like there are APIs, and the data is there. You can rewrite it automatically. Uh, but I, I don't think it provides value. And more and more, our systems are such that we understand uh, when pages are being compiled automatically. And then we will say, oh, maybe the whole website is just automatic content. We should demote the whole website. Uh, so that's kind of the, the long-term view. I would focus more on having <laughs> fewer pages and making them a lot stronger. Oh, OK, I understand. Um, uh, can I ask? Um... In more details, for example, uh, when people are searching, uh, moving from uh, Toronto to Vancouver, they are living in uh, Toronto. They know about the city. And if I submit a lot of information about Vancouver, uh, if uh, someone want to move from Vancouver to Toronto, they will read information. They don't need it. You know, they don't need to know uh, more about Vancouver. Uh, they want to know about Toronto. And you know, at that point, we, we can confuse some people uh, to submit information they don't need at all. I, I, would, I would argue they probably don't need the information the other way around either. Or for like example, if you're trying, like if you, if you're, like imagine you're in a situation, you need to move to a different city for work. Do you need background information on what the weather is like there? You're, you're looking for a transport company. You're not looking for kind of like city information. Whereas if you're looking for city information, then you explicitly look for city information. You don't kind of say, well, oh, look, on this transport company page, there is now a weather report from the other city. How useful. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's something where it's very easy to provide this kind of information, but I don't think it's something that search engines would say, oh, this is so useful to have this extra information here. They really try to focus on that individual query. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Dave, I think you had a question. Oh, yeah, just a, a quick one, really. I was quite interested to see uh, you're saying that the Core Web Vitals will count for no index pages and things blocked to the robots text and stuff. Um, it's quite interesting um, because obviously in Search Console, these are aggregated. You get a group of pages. How do you understand that the that this is a group? If these are no index, then you've not got the context and stuff, or is it just based on the URL path? Or you know, and I know it's not even a ranking factor yet. So in the future, we don't really know <laughs> exactly yeah. how it's going to apply. But that's quite worrying. If you've got something in a members area, some kind of tool that takes a while, you've got bad vitals, but it's not really bad because it's expected. It's what it is. If that's going to leak out into your other site, that's probably going to be quite worrying for some people. But I, I don't know. Um, I mean, my my general feeling is there that uh, that's something that's also part of your website. So if you like, you use some extra functionality and that's no index, then kind of like people see that as a part of your website and say, well. This website is slow, or this website is fast, kind of thing. Um, I I don't know how Search Console reports on that particularly. I think within the uh, Chrome user experience report data in the the Chrome developer site, they have some information on how the the grouping is made, but I don't know how how detailed that is there. Right. Oh, so that's a good one to go and get in. Thanks, John. I mean, one of the, the tricky parts is also it's, it's very hard for us to understand when a page is something that is not meant to be indexed, um, because like all of the canonical decisions and, and all of that, it's like just looking at an individual page on its own, it's sometimes not absolutely clear, is this something that can be accessed directly, or does that cookie that was set in the beginning need to be set to access the page, or like what, what all is involved there? So I imagine that's. Uh, always kind of tricky to to balance out. Yeah, a lot of moving parts. <laughs> uh, John, I had one follow up on that. On that, it is actually very interesting. Uh, I was also thinking the same. So, uh, from SEO side, how SEO team should be worried about it? Because there are a lot of pages that are no indexed. A lot of pages, especially in travel websites, there are so many search pages. 
right on that case then how to ensure that uh, pages are not at least decreasing the mobile ranking it is very tricky for us i i don't have any great answers for you at the moment uh, so should so should we expect till may there should be some document update maybe maybe i i don't know what what the information out there is on the grouping at the moment so it's it's really hard for me to say exactly like what you need to watch out for what you can kind of ignore in in general when it comes to grouping across websites when we try to do grouping we try to do that on the one hand by url pattern and on the other hand also by by the kind of content on the site and those are i think the the way that we do the groupings in search console for example uh, so if you have parts of your website that you want to be seen as belonging together then i would definitely make sure that from a url pattern pattern point of view, it's clear that these belong together. Uh, so if you're specifically worried about search pages, for example, then putting those in, in a folder with slash search makes it a little bit easier for us to understand all of these search pages belong together, all of these product pages belong together, and all of these blog posts belong together. Um, we might be able to treat them in individually when it comes to core web vitals. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is we don't have a ton of aggregated data for every website. Uh, it might be that for some sites, we, we just have few data points. So we just have kind of for the website overall information on the core web vitals. And in that case, even if you use URL structures to split things up cleanly, we might not be able to use kind of that grouping because we, we just don't have enough data for those individual groups. Uh, so that's something where I suspect over time probably we'll be able to have a little bit more information, but it'll still be something that is not 100% such that you can just say, oh, ignore this page and do count that page kind of thing on, on a website. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. You, you see something similar, it, like it's is, totally unrelated to this, but more related to grouping when it comes to adult content, uh, where if we can clearly understand the adult content belongs to this part of a website, then we can use safe search and say, well, the subdirectory or the subdomain uh, must be filtered by safe search. Whereas if we can't tell that that belongs in just one part of the site, then we might say, well, the whole website needs to be uh, filtered with regards to safe search. Uh, so that's. Also something where sometimes we have more data points, we can do that clearer. Sometimes we just don't have enough data points, and we can't kind of do it that fine-grained. Mm -hmm. OK, all right. All right. I think we're kind of at time. Um, maybe if there's one last question from anyone, happy to take that. Otherwise, we'll call it a week. Oh, can I ask about adult content? <laughs> because you mentioned it. Um, uh, you know, uh, some SEO specialists think that uh, uh, we should use uh, white hat techniques for white niches if we are talking uh, adult content or some specific languages, uh, including Russian language. You know, uh, it's better to use black hat techniques. Can you reply to this uh, and uh, how we can create links uh, or provide some link building if you start from scratch, have no authority, trust, and you want to get some links to earn them, but with adult content, it's tough. And uh, do you have some suggestions what to do? I mean, I can't suggest that you should use black hat techniques. So from that point of view, I, I can really only point at uh, our guidelines with regards to what we do recommend. Uh, so I, I understand that some people might say, oh, well, it's like everyone else in my niche is doing it the wrong way. Therefore, I also need to do it that way. Um, and I, I don't know. Like it, it might be that there are individual sp special niches where where our systems just aren't picking up the the kind of the abusive or problematic uh, techniques well enough. Uh, but I mean, from from my point of view, if you want to look at the long long run and not just focus on something that might work for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, then I would tend to focus more on that what we have documented. But uh, I mean. 
like everyone tries out different things and sometimes kind of the best advice doesn't work for you so like i i don't know i can't hold physically hold you back from doing kind of uh, it's not my opinion you know <laughs> I, I just share uh, thoughts uh, that you can find on uh, reddit or many forums uh, where people uh, share the thoughts that we, we should use black hat techniques for adult niches because uh, you can't get results with white hat. I, I just want to know your thoughts yeah. about My, I, I think, I mean, there's a lot of talk on online forums in general, and it's hard to understand like who really knows what they're talking about. And so that's, I don't know, it's always worth taking that with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Uh, Dwayne, I think. You just raised your hand as well. Hi, John. I, yes. So I have a situation where I've seen uh, AMP articles being served on desktop, even though we have the proper canonical setup and we don't have self-referring AMP um, canonicals. Is there something that we should worry about there? Um. I don't know. Like if if you just occasionally see that, my guess is it's more a matter of kind of a skew from crawling and indexing that we maybe picked up the AMP version first and we didn't pick up the desktop version yet. Uh, so we might show the AMP version temporarily in the search results as well. Uh, but if you see that regularly, especially for the same URLs for the long run, then that feels like something where either we can't understand that connection properly. Uh, or there is something going wrong on our side. Uh, so what what I might do there is maybe post in the search help forum or the, the webmaster help forum and include some of the details that you have there, especially if it's something that you see happening regularly and uh, it's always the same URLs. Then that's something where the folks there can take a look with their tools and kind of their understanding of how things work and otherwise escalate that to Googlers if needed. OK, thank you. All right. So let's take a break here. Uh, it's been great having you all here. Um, I'm, I'm glad this time kind of worked out. Uh, if you. I guess I'll set these up a little bit more regularly and on Fridays as well uh, to try to cover that US time zone. Uh, because it feels like during the week when I usually have these planned on Tuesdays, there's like always so much other things happening trying to, to get my time. Uh, so maybe on Friday, it'll be a little bit easier. Uh, thank you all for joining here. Uh, I hope you all have a great weekend. And stay safe, and hopefully see you in one of the future Hangouts. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Right, John. Thank you.